good evening from the sinister woods of Maine. Um, I wanted to uh, come back to uh, sort of overlap the end of the last lecture that I did um, because it was dealing with the uh, the extinction event of the dinosaurs was the primary focus of that and I used a, a few lines of evidence to um, drive that home that there may have been more <clears throat> than just the impact event of the uh, Chicxulub uh, impact event and that being that the, uh, that the Decon traps uh, erupted uh, before, during, and after that impact event. And prior to the actual impact event, the Dickon Traps, um, you know, that large, large igneous, uh, large igneous province, the Lip, over in India that covered most of the, the uh, subcontinent um, in the order of miles, uh, caused a lot of problems in the few million years leading up to um, the impact event of the uh, Chicxulub, which basically sealed the end of the dinosaurs. Um, the idea basically was is that uh, you know the Earth was already being stressed from the amount of uh, you know SO2, CO2, uh, acid into the oceans, uh, dropping sea level. All these were contributing to a real problem coming towards the end of the Cretaceous period about 66 uh, million years ago. Um, and then of course uh, you know as these things are erupting, the the, the meteorite comes, it hits, um, <clears throat> causing its own <clears throat> plethora of massive problems that, that certainly would have, you know, been in the geologic record without the traps for sure. Um, but the idea is that maybe these two are related and maybe the traps, like the rest of the crust, uh, when you get something that hits that large, may have been actually agitated from the impact, uh, from the vigorous shaking. Uh, it produced an earthquake that was felt worldwide and maybe even a 9.0 worldwide quake. So. Um, just to give it a quick summary, because there's something I want to show that I didn't have the, I, I kind of biffed it on the slides, but I'm going to make that real clear in a minute. Um, the traps initially erupt slow, um, but enough to cool and heat the climate. Uh, oceanic crust production wanes, sea level drops, and the interior sea waves and shelves, um, allowing more extreme weather fluctuations, drop in sea level stresses out sea levels. The traps release massive amounts of toxins, most specifically mercury into the atmosphere. Impact of that comes uh, blocking out the sun, producing a 9 to 11 uh, magnitude quake, a, a worldwide tsunami, and probably a, a 9.0 uh, earthquake worldwide, triggering volcanism, and also causing the Deccan traps to start erupting at a much higher rate. Uh, massive temperature fluctuations in a short period of time due to the impact in volcanism. Uh, volcanism also acidifies oceans, may contribute to anoxia of, of water bodies uh, as evidence of dark shales around the world after this. And primary food sources are, are wiped, resulting in worldwide famine. And, um, and lastly, um, a possible massive increase of lava under the deck on traps flex the crust and may be related to vertical cracks in older lava flows uh, prior to impact but don't show up after them. Um, sea level drop uh, later in the Cretaceous, a huge sea level drop, no seaways. Uh, as Camp uh, Central Atlantic Magmatic Province decreases, uh, lowering oceanic crust along the mid-ocean ridges, uh, which makes climate more susceptible to temperature fluctuations and which stresses uh, nearshore organisms and their food sources. All right, so this is what I, I, I failed to, to, to uh, drive home. So in this area, I mean, in this uh, Google map, you're going to see these lines right here. I mean, they just run vertical cracks, um, all sorts of places. You know, they're here, here, but oddly enough, they are not up here. You know, one could say that might be one, but that's not going the right orientation and may, may, might even just be a river. The point being is that maybe when that impact event occurred and it shook up what was obviously a very volatile area uh, underneath the subcontinent of India, um, is it possible that it could have just been such a, such a, uh, a, 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 a an enormous uh, flexure or pulse or agitation to the lava that could it have lifted parts of the subcontinent? 
and cause these these cracks and then of course after the impact you don't see the cracks anymore because the, these newer lava flows weren't around when that when this happened so this is pre-impact and this is post-impact and the way that you would do this is you're going to look at these faults or somebody's going to go in there and look and see what the movement was now my guess if it, is if it flexed it would be normal faulting um at least yeah it would be normal faulting but then it's going to contract so I don't know if it goes back to where it was, if you maybe you can't tell movement. Um, I don't know, but interesting that you have vertical cracks all over um, uh, some of these traps, but in lower, older lavas, but not on the upper ones. So that's just something that, uh, that might be uh, happening. And I picked that up from a lecture. I am not that smart. Um, I base a lot of my stuff off of lectures that I watch. And uh, as I get into this, I'm going to be giving these guys much more credit because I would not be anywhere near this if I... Uh, and here's another one. I mean, this is suspicious right here. What, what is that? And guess what? It stops. There's something here. Right? Kind of stops there. Um, I don't know. But things to consider. And the idea is that this is what did it. So this area here is represented by this area here. In other words, there's, it was, this is older. Uh, and then you have the impact event, and then you get an intrusion, or or it expands, or just the uh, just the shaking of it could have done it, and you get stress being forced outward. So in other words, this is forcing this this these older lava flows up. So the earthquakes, uh, lava flows prior to influx of magma or vigorous shaking, impact event. These are the stress vectors. Earthquakes uh, from impact agitate crust and magma, flexing above, uh, crust above and fracturing it. After impact, you have all these stress fractures right here, and they're probably filled up with uh, magma cracks, at least some of them. Uh, not necessarily all, but you, you would have probably had some magma influx in here, but you're going to have these cracks right here. And then a new lava flow comes. It has no cracks in it, um, but the older ones still retain the cracks. And then you erode, you know, say this or whatever, and you're going to see these cracks show up, but not up here. So the, the upper part of the mountain, we'll just say, is part of this black flow like up here and then the lower part of it is these where you see the cracks so I hope that's kind of clear this happened after the impact event there is no flexure uh, flexing of the crust if there ever was uh, so therefore the cracks do not show up in here but these are loaded with them because they're older and they were pre-impact as you can see here and that's how that happened all right and that sort of followed up here with the fact that that a lot more magma was produced after the impact and this is pre-impact this is post-impact and you really uh, you can see that there's a lot more lava that was produced after impact uh, volume again um, you know this is the amount that was there prior and then you have these eruptions after and this is impact right, right there uh, again more review just showing eruptive uh, eruptive rates this is the impact here and then you have all of this after these are the probabilities of the actual impact itself. And lead, uh, uranium lead kind of puts it here um, after this first episode, whereas the um, argon, argon seems to put it a little bit lower. So, yeah, hard to say. Uh, maybe both, you know, who knows? Um, maybe you had a flux here and then you had a massive flux here. I don't know. And, and it could be sampling bias. I, I, I don't know. Um, but uh, it does give a little bit of different curves uh, in, 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 in uh, models. Again, same thing here. Eruptive rate activity. You got your pulse, big flux right here, and then another one later. But this is the, the earlier one. Temperature. We already went over that. Sea level. All right. We already went through all this. The Cretaceous Paleogene Extinction Event. Also known as KT extinction, was a sudden mass extinction of three quarters of plant and animal species on Earth, approximately 66 million years ago. The event caused the extinction of all non-avian dinosaurs. Most tetrapods, uh, weigh, uh, most other tetrapods weighing more than 25 kilos or around 60 pounds, 55 pounds, also became extinct, with the exception of some ectothermic species such as sea turtles and crocodilians. Uh, it marked the end of the Cretaceous period. And with it, the Mesozoic, while well, heralding the beginning of the Cenozoic era, which continues to this day. All right. So immediately after all of this, uh, just to recap, temperatures experienced uh, extreme fluctuations uh, and then begin to rise over the next million years. 
The immediate nuclear winter uh, eradicates most species, both plant, animal, and marine. Landscapes worldwide are barren, uh, and po are barren and populated by ferns, and the species that can survive on them. Hint, there's a reason why this species that does survive uh, does, and it's all because of the ferns. Um, oceans acidic, likely anoxic due to heat, uh, and then it and, and takes maybe tens if not millions of years, tens of thousands of years to recuperate. Small animal mammals, ground dwelling uh, birds begin to occupy niches left behind by dinos and experience rapid diversification. Whoop. Um, Bony fish, sharks, turtles, crocodiles, and small mammals, and being small in warm in water, warm-blooded, having feathers, all help cross the KT extinction event. Um, and of note is that fungi took a hit, uh, but they don't need it, it. They don't really need photosynthesis to survive, and they actually thrive briefly after the event for reasons I have no idea. I just thought that was an interesting tidbit. All right, so here we are, le last lecture, and I'm finishing this today. Um, this has been 200 and I think 310 slides and I and I really want to finish it up and try to try to work it again. I'm going to probably have to record the whole thing again. But that's neither here nor there. So, who made it, who did not? Well, so here's evolution and times over here. Uh, amphibians, they handled it. The mammals, they handled it. Uh, the lizards, uh, they handled it. And the crocs, they handled it. However, the dinosaurs did not. They rest in peace. All of them. This is your line. You got your ankylosaurs, your hydrosaurs, your ceratopsians, sauropods, tyrannosaurs, overlaps, raptors. Uh, I don't want to try to pronounce that. And tronidids, uh, and another one I wanted to pronounce, and I definitely might even make an attempt at that. But anyways, all um, dinosaurs and did not make the, the cut. Um, I apologize. Uh, dinosaurs kind of go to here, and then the birds. Um, these are birds that didn't make it. I apologize for that. Uh, and then we do have a species of birds that does make it, and those are the birds that we see today. The Methyses. Um So uh, it was a very damaging thing uh, to have that happen, and uh, it took out the dinosaurs. And to be honest with you, you know, <laughs> Had they not wiped out, I mean, it'd be pretty tough to say that we, we would we would be the dominant species today because they were on a very long time. Um, they were very successful. Um, you know, intelligence-wise, you know, everything else around that time, uh, you know, nothing was really that much smarter than anything else as far as the dinos. I mean, some dinosaurs, I'm sure, were. Um, but the mammals became as intelligent as we are in the 65 million years since their demise so it's it's a safe it, it, you could say that the dying the reptile might have done the same thing um it had it hasn't um and the reality is uh you know we only became dominant very recently so i i don't know i just think that it would have retarded for, for certain the development of mammal species if we had not taken the the, uh, we had not been the, the highest species or the most populous species after the extinction event. I think dinosaurs would have considered, evolved considerably and taken up many niches and the mammals might be a fairly small, uh, still might be a fairly small um, uh, uh, phylum right now, but they didn't. So, you know, it happened and that's the way it happened. So es estimated mean temperature uh, near the Cretaceous extinction of event. Uh, so we are seeing right here that, uh, you know, when we get really close to it, you've got the uh, trap activity here. Uh, temperatures are beginning to, to bang around a lot, but they're really starting to fluctuate um, and, uh, and heat up. And this is basically because of the dick on traps pumping all that CO2 in the air. Uh, and then, of course, this hits, and then we have a, 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 just a plummet. Uh, you get a quick spike, a plummet, and it, and it kind of bounces around for quite a while. Um, but, uh, it, it just goes to show you again that the end of the Cretaceous, uh, you did not want to be around. It, it, the, it, the earth was really going through some times. Um, this is sort of the, uh, uh, vertebrae diversity. And it's interestingly enough, it sort of, it sort of halts here. Um, I don't know why and what this actually implies. So I'm not even really going to discuss it. Um, 
but uh, I, it has a lot to do with the diversification of species, I guess. And I'm not a biologist, so I don't really know all that. Um, this right here, uh, categories of insect damage on leaves. Um, interesting that this is really high, and then it drops, and then it just plummets, which makes sense because if you were airborne, the soot would have taken you out, not to mention all the, uh, the sulfuric, the acid rain and everything like that. Um, and this is this is basically telling us where life is, you know, how well life's doing. You can just think of it that way. So it goes good, and then you get a plummet after the traps start erupting. And these are probably, you know, then it comes up, and these are just bouncing around, probably related to this stuff going on here. But then obviously when this hits, it just goes down. Huge. I mean, the biggest drop, really, I mean, the biggest drop of the whole period. Um, and then it sort of rebounds, but then drops back down again as life tries to get going, but then gets halted, so... Anyways, uh, bird survival. All right, ground drilling birds recovered quickly um, as they primarily feed on ferns. And as I mentioned earlier, ferns are one of the first plants uh, to recover after scorching events. So we have things that are somewhat reptilian. Um, they are descendants of the dinosaurs or what's left of them, and they are birds. Uh, the uh, as it turns out, it's the ground-dwelling birds that really seem to uh, to uh, make the recovery. They're flightless. Um, again, birds probably weren't really able to fly after that Im impact event, uh, if you think about it, or anything with feathers, because it just would have been torn apart. So, ground-dwelling birds that were able to seek refuge, probably, you know, coal or whatever, tree, they lived. And... This is what they fed on, ferns. And you can see this huge spike right here of ferns, and that was their food source. Um, and that's how they did it. So, uh, you know, you got your Cretaceous coming, and then everything gets whacked and goes down. But then during after the scorching event, you get nice, big, big, matte forest of ferns. And guess what? Birds love the, the, this one type of bird, love ferns. And it just goes nuts, and it, it, it allows it to live. And believe me, it does live, and it evolves into some epic things. Um, so here's over here sort of the, you know, high diversity, Cretaceous flora. This is when the world's all happy. Then you have the disaster flora, and it's right here, right in the, uh, right after the impact. And that's the ferns. Um, you also get some angiosperms and some gymnosperms. So actually, they're really low. Uh, and the... K tax is just whack, you know, decimated. Really doesn't make much of a comeback. Um, ferns die back down to normal, and then they kind of come back. Uh, the angiosperms make a nice recovery, and as well as the gymnosperms. But um, so this is the transition period here, uh, and then you get low diversity, and then fl flora just really starts to take off again and blossom. But that's how the birds did it. It was the ferns. And as I said, these birds, uh, they began to. Um, they began to diversify and really occupy niches left by um, the dinosaurs. And this is a terra bird. Um, I really don't feel good about that cat because that cat's not going to make it. But if you look at the design, you got a big head. You got eyes sort of, you know, forward facing. Uh, arms, they're there, but they're 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 not feathers, but they're they're arms, but they aren't that, they aren't overly muscular. Um, but you've got these powerful legs and this, you know, this three-toed foot with talons on it. Um, this is a same body design as a Tyrannosaur, except we've exchanged the, the teeth for a beak that is equally as gnarly. Uh, this beak is like a foot long, and it's just a giant spike, really, uh, uh, at, uh, at, uh, um, on the end of, a, you know, something that can hit with the force of a, of a jackhammer. So... Um, a very dangerous, very uh, an apex predator for sure. Probably six to eight feet tall right here. Maybe even nine. I don't know. I mean, there's no real scale. That's what's to say that's four, three. I don't know, three. Yeah, six to eight feet. Um, this is the terror bird skull. Um, as you can see, uh, the Tyrannosaur tooth was about the same size. Right around, you know, a little bit shorter, but telling you and look at the muscles i mean you have all sorts of for a very powerful clamp right here and this is its weapon and it probably just continued to grow judging by the design here very robust can take the hit um all right so now we in the paleocene and the paleocene uh is about 66 well 65 million years ago um 
to, oh, I can't remember, 50 something. I, I, when I get into the, uh, the, um, the, you know, the Paleocene, the Oligocene, the Miocene, and all these, I have to really, um, look at my cheat sheets on that to get those exact pages because they're kind of funky. Um, obviously much shorter than the, uh, you know, the older ages that we did. Um, but the earth is starting to look like, you know, it does now. Um, what's going on here? We have uh, our, here we are. Um, you know, these are more rolling mountains now. There's not a whole lot of, uh, of um, you know, mountainous terrain. Uh, you know, it's pretty leveled out. Um, I think there was a little bit of uplift for one reason or another in the Cretaceous uh, that kind of made it a tableland, but not much more else. You've got Cuba down here, Haiti, I maybe Puerto Rico here. You've got some subduction starting to occur right here. Um, we are in a fairly uh, uh, warm time uh, after this, so everything's pretty green where we are. Um, it. For the most part, uh, you would, this would be a somewhat recognizable world. The West Coast is beginning to take shape. There is no Baja, California. Um, yeah, there is no, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Hudson Bay or anything here because the Ice Age has not happened yet. <coughs> Alaska is beginning to take shape. Greenland has rifted slightly off of North America, but this rift ends up stopping, um, and sea levels are down. So there's no interior flooding really, uh, a little bit here in the North Sea. But the North Atlantic is finally starting to do its final phase of opening, and that's the scene. And the uh, paleogeography of the Paleocene um, is, you know, you got your shield. We've got uh, shallow marine sediments being deposited off of the, you know, what's left of the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, definitely with the Rocky Mountains. The Mount Rocky Mountains are are uh, are kind of in their prime. They're they're totally taking shape right now, um, and they are. Uh, they are definitely on their way up, and so they're shedding massive volumes of uh, of um, debris, you know, both to the uh, to the west and to the east. Um, you know, a lot wherever the divide is, all that stuff from that side is going into the Gulf of Mexico, and from everything from the west is going into the Pacific Ocean, and they are substantial amounts. And so, um, at this point, again, sea level is fairly low. Um, we have uh, deposition from the continent. Uh, North American continent um, from the mountains going into the Gulf of Mexico, the East Coast. Um, looks like there's a small sea right here um, called the Cannonball Sea. I've never seen that before. Uh, and of course, the Rocky Mountains, and then we have sediments going to the West Coast. Eocene period uh, 50.2 million years ago. Uh, here we are. Uh, Middle Eocene, uh, it's really starting to look like something that we would recognize now uh, in the world. Uh, you got your Atlantic Ocean, not quite as big. Um, you have the, four, the you have, basically what's happening here is the, uh, the uh, Central American bridge uh, is beginning to set up. And I don't think it's here yet, but we have subduction all the way from Alaska, all the way around, the, uh, basically across the whole west coast of the Americas is one giant subduction zone. Um, and then the other subduction zone is in the Mediterranean through um, the Middle East and then um, across the Himalayas um, or what are going to be the Himalayas and then across going east-west uh, sort of near the equator um, out past Australia. So, so, and then there's, of course, a big uh, subduction zone on the uh, east coast of uh, Asia. Um, Australia is finally separated from um, Antarctica and it's trying to make its way north and of note here is India is really moving quickly across the uh, the Indian Ocean and is now uh, making contact with um, with Asia and the Himalayas are about to be built. Eocene 40.0 million years ago. Uh, here's North America again. Um, we are, I mean, not really a whole lot's changed. You're seeing uh, definitely uh, more of a familiar um, um, uh, Caribbean. Uh, again, Puerto Rico's not really here yet. I'm not sure if it breaks off of here or not. 
But this right here is, is the, this, this subduction zone is slowly getting dragged out this way, and, and with it, it's building an island arc right here, um, and uh, it's raising some parts uh, over here. Uh, this is the uh, Yucatan, Gulf of Mexico. Florida is still underwater at this point, uh, very shallow, but still underwater. Uh, West Coast here. Uh, California is really not, it's about, you've got about half of it there. Uh, it still needs to, to build out a little bit. And um, it is around this time that the Rocky Mountains have, have, the, have finished, I believe it's the Laramide orogeny, um, but I believe that's over. And so now the Rockies are going to start really shedding. Um, and if you ever go out to the beaches of California, you can see all sorts of uh, new rock. It's you know, cobbles and uh, just everything mixed in along the coast. I mean, from just tons and tons of debris coming off of these, these the Rockies. And here we are. Uh, Maine is pretty much, uh, again, um, sea level is a little higher. Climate's a little bit warmer. Um, but... I would say that our climate at this particular time is probably much like uh, South Carolina, maybe, because um, we are moving north. It might even be Georgia-esque, but uh, it, it's definitely getting cooler, um, and the mountains are pretty much leveled to just rolling uh, flatlands. All right, well, something happens because our mountains are not flat and rolling anymore, um, and there's a reason why. <laughs> well, at least we think there's a couple of reasons. Um, <clears throat> well, the first is, is that the east coast of the United States, the northeast, has a couple of weird things going on. We know it has a bunch of terrains, but we also have in the middle, uh, sort of sandwiched between Vermont and we'll say uh, southwestern New York is the Adirondacks. And the Adirondacks are... Um, are very interesting um, because they're not part of the Appalachian Mountains. They're part of the Grenville Orogeny, which is twice as old. I'm sorry, it's not twice as old. It is three times as old. Um, Grenville goes back, you know, a billion years. Well, in this, this is the Adirondacks right here. And we think, well, something has happened under the Adirondacks in the last, uh, in, the, in the last, you know, a few tens of millions of years because they're, why are they sticking out? Um, it, it's almost like a bullseye on the, on the Adirondacks and the rocks exposed here again are three times as old as these. So something has had to push these up in the last, you know, 10, 15, 20, 30 million years. Something has occurred here. And as it turns out, when we look at, when I look at a map, a Google map, I can see that this area is active. Something is hap happening under here and something is pushing it up. And we believe that there is a, um, a, uh, a warm spot under there, a hot spot or something, or a plume of some sort that is pushing up on the Adirondacks. And we think it may even be a piece of mantle that it broke off, um, which it does eventually when, it, when things get subducted under, they get to a point where they end up just failing and then they, they, they drop off. Um, and when they do, you can get uh, a heat plume or this will melt um, this will melt more and produce uh, magma under here, and it will start to push up. And geophysical measurements are suggesting that that is exactly what's happening right under here under the Adirondacks. And remember, this is a much older piece of crust than here or here or here. And when the Taconic Mountains slammed into this, uh, the Taconic Slab did not go under this. Um, the Taconic Slab went this way, but um, once the taconic hit, then subduction went this way. So it is fair to say that we don't, I don't know if this is a old piece of crust, uh, from the Grenville or it's a piece of, uh, of, um, of, um, taconic crust or Iapetus that's, you know, that's been subducted back here somewhere. Um, but whatever the case is, something's melting and something is rising and something is, is, is caused almost a mile of uplift, uh, in comparison to the surrounding area so one of one good culprit to do this would be a uh, slab uh, break off and um so after all these set events um and this is where it kind of gets uh if for if you really like heavy duty technical stuff and geophysics stuff this is where it, it starts to get fun um, what I have here is a map, and it's basically giving us a temperature and a, 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 a depth point, and then the temperature of that depth point of the continental crust and the moho. 
Um, and what it does is it kind of tells us, you know, where things are um, in relation to um, to the column underneath. And so, in other words, uh, you know, what what is this crust? Um, you know, lying on, or what? what is beneath this, and what's beneath this, how thick is this, how thick is this, um, what are the densities, because we know that these are essentially, these can be two different things, depending on what's happened over, you know, the last 300 million years, so, and as that turns out, that that is true, so we're going to look at this right here, and anything in blue, we were just going to consider this the uh, Laurentia, this is the basically North America, this is actually called the Cameron line, um, but anything in blue is 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 originally North American. It it, it did not uh, it originated there or near it, and that is all North American. And this is areas where it's exposed, and this is areas where it's covered. This line right here is the suture of the Iapetus Ocean. So when the ocean closed, the Iapetus Ocean closed. This is the line drawn in the sand so to speak so in other words everything in here is either part of the iapetus ocean or on the other side of it and everything over here is part of north america so as the iapetus ocean closed we know that um we know that we built uh the taconic mountain range and then we had the acadian uh the acadian uh orogeny that built mountains through here um and then we had um Avalonia, which is this part right here, uh, smash into it, and then all of this in here are the associated. Uh, it's basically the it's it, it's it's a series of some uh, felsic continental crust and island arcs, and we this is just called the Gandaria terrain, and the Gandaria terrain is essentially um, some people think it's the the continental shelf of the of the of Avalonia, others people think it's just a it's a it's a foreland piece that broke off from a separate area uh, near Avalonia, uh, off of South America. Um, in any case, it is just a terrain of ocean sediments and uh, sands and silts and some ocean, uh, continental crust that has just all been slammed in and makes up this this in this area right here. And this is what we would consider the Iapetus Ocean and what's left of it. It's Conic Seaway kind of over here. Um, but this is the Iapetus. So, in any case, um, so when you look at this, Avalon is here. That's the con that's the piece of subcontinent that came off of Africa. Um, More town terrain right here. Um, these are parts of island arcs and sedimentary uh, and, and sediments, oceanic sediments. Um, the arcs right here. These 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 are full island arcs right here. That's a full island arc, and that's another island arc over here. Um, these are the sediments for the Slurian and Devonian that were coming off of the arcs and uh, the approaching continents. Uh, and then the dark green are intrusives, and these are areas where we have uh, granitic, diuretic, uh, just all sorts of, um, of igneous uh, intrusions that are associated with uh, the Gandaria terrain uh, uh, being crunched and then subducted under um, as Avalonia uh, came, to, came and crashed into uh, North America. So when we look in the ground, we see that there is actually different. Uh, there's different temperatures and different uh, seismic velocities. And interestingly enough, kind of following the Cameron line is this dotted line right here. And you know what that is? Well, one can see it diverges a little bit up here. Um, it it basically tells you that these two pieces of crust are different, um, and they have different. Uh, because they have different velocities. So if you look right here, you see Laurentia, which is this. You have the Iapetian suture, which is what this dotted line is. And then you have Iapetus sediments and accreted terrains right here. So these are all accreted terrains. This is the crust that's beneath those accreted terrains. This is the what's left of the Iapetus ocean, or the, this is what's left of the sediments that were in the Iapetus ocean on the Gandaria terrain. And then there's a huge break right here. And what's interesting is this is the Laurentian crust. This is this is this is beneath Laurentia. So we have we have um 
different thicknesses on the crust. This is thinner. This this is thicker. So there's there's less there's less distance here than there is here. So all this is saying is that this is a different type of crust. It's thinner, and and it's shown by by the moho being there. And then this is thicker, and that's shown by the moho being here. And that's kind of interesting to know because this gives you an idea of of the crust and the nature of it. And that's how we tell that these are two different pieces of crust. Ganderia, iapetus sediments, island arcs, got all sorts of stuff in there. Um, but this is true continental crust from this point back. Oligocene, 25 million years ago. Uh, yeah, I mean, what, what can I say? You've got the Arctic Ocean here. New England's really start. I mean, it, it, you would recognize this world. This is California. You've got the San Andreas Fault starting to show its face right here, and it's going to start rifting pieces of California off. You've got your Jamaica. You've got your Cuba. Um, again, I'm still looking for um, Puerto Rico. I'm, I'm guessing it just gets broken off of one of these, maybe this piece here. Um, and this is starting to move out. Um, interesting, though, they don't have the... Uh, the Bermuda High, and I know that's pretty old. Well, maybe it may, I don't know the exact, I thought it was about 50 million years, but I might be wrong. Miocene, 15 million years. Climate's becoming cooler. You're starting to see Florida is still that. Yes, now we're starting to see faulting here, and this big piece, this is going to become Puerto Rico right here. You have the Lesser Antilles, you have the volcanic arc here, Bahamas, something here, maybe it's Bermuda. Um, again, Still rolling lands, very, very green, very flat uh, mid um, coastal plains. Um, the uh, Rockies are starting to shed their sediments. Alaska, you've got the Aleutian Arc here, um, and we have the North Atlantic here, and even Iceland. And the world, Maya 14 million years ago, it's a world that we recognize. You've got South America, you've got subduction in the Western Atlantic, you've got Africa looking just like Africa does, pushing into and trying to close the Mediterranean, and it eventually will. Um, you have India, you got the Tibetan Plateau, the, uh, you know, the Himalayas at this point are, are pretty good size. Um, Australia has now moved significantly far away from uh, Antarctica. You've got the Indonesian subduction zone, you've got the Pacific subduction zones, um, you've got the subduction zones over here in the Western Pacific as well as here. Uh, you've got the Japanese island arc here. Um, so it's a world we're recognizing. Eight million years ago. Well, I would say that this is pretty much, uh, we're seeing Florida start to come out. Um, New England is right here. Again, not, we just have not had much happen uh, in, the last, uh, in the last 40 million years. Because once we become a passive, um, a passive, uh, um, coastline, there's no volcanics, there's no real earthquakes, there's no real anything. We haven't had, uh, you know, not much of an ice age really yet, uh, but it's coming. Um, so uh, we, we just, we're sighted, we're just an idol. New England is a, it's a place that seems to be getting colder through most of the Cenozoic as, um, as, our, as our temperature slowly drops over time. Um, sea levels are becoming a little bit lower. Um, as you can see, there isn't much of a shelf showing here as much. Florida is now beginning to emerge. Um, the Gulf of Mexico uh, is the delta is beginning to so so like I said um, you're starting to see sediments move their way out um, all of this is going to make a you know that's what happens all the sediments get put out here and then they eventually end up here in this case here here and here uh, whereas ours end up here and here and here Pleistocene the height of the ice age so here we are under about a mile of ice um, yeah you don't want anything to do with that uh, we have the Atlantic Ocean has now drained, sea level has dropped significantly, exposing the uh, Bahama platform, the Bermuda platform. We have uh, a nice uh, side, uh, strike slip fault right here, moving Puerto Rico into its current location as this uh, subduction begins to eat its way across the, um, the, the, the Atlantic Ocean. This is actually Pacific Ocean crust, by the way. It's, it's just, uh, it's being pulled through here. Um, Gulf of Mexico looks like it, it, it does in present day. You've even got the keys here um, because the, the platform has been drained. You've got lakes out west. I've always thought, I guess the glaciers just don't run over these, but it seems to me that you would have had snow all the way down here um, since the elevations are higher. Uh, glaciers in the Gulf of Mexico, 
uh, I mean the Gulf of Calif of um, extending out into the Gulf of Alaska. Uh, this should all be frozen because um, it would be Greenland. Yeah, that's the ice age. Glaciation. Um, this is a glaciation a glaciation map, and well, it's a surficial map. And what it does is it shows the majority of things that have happened to Maine. Um, since the last glaciation you know obviously we see lots of rocks and, and mountains and everything but in between those rocks and valleys and all of that we have um sediments and they usually consist of what we call the presumpscate formation which is a beautiful melange of everything um small rocks clay silt sands um you name it uh very difficult to build on, uh, causes problems in the construction industry, and it's all over Maine. So no matter where you go, you're going to find that. Um, and that's just all the debris and stuff that was picked up as the glacier just scraped across and picked up stuff. Um, so Maine has it all. We've got drumlins, we've got uh, eskers, we've got terminal moraines, we've got, you know, everything, you, kettles, uh, erratic boulders, everything, you know, U-shaped valleys, everything in Maine. Everything that, that associated with glaciers happens, and we find it everywhere. Um, but what a particular interest is, I don't have the line right here, but if I could kind of just make a line that goes like that, what you're going to see is that basically is tell that whole line right there was how far in the ocean went when the ice first melted because the ice was so thick it pushed down the crust about a mile. So this was all underwater except for peaks and islands and, and what have you. So it's really interesting. So basically this is just a map of all the surface, the loose stuff and in the, in, in, in the, in the sands and the silts and everything. And obviously if it was on a bigger screen, I would be able to blow it up. But for me, I can't really see much on it. So um, I'm just going to make mention of it. And this is sort of the, you, you, get, um, you get full extent of uh, glacial ice into the ocean. Ice begins to retreat. You get some um, some exposed shoreline, and then uh, ice can t totally retreats, and then you have um, some of the formations left behind uh, by the ice. Uh, Mount Katahdin's official geologic map. Um, this is just showing the the these are the two cirques. So Baxter Peak would be yeah, Baxter Peak. I think is here. Pomola's here. Uh, this is the Hamlin Peak here. These are all, this is the Baxter, this is the Mount, you know, the Baxter Cirque. Uh, this is the, the, the Hamlin Peak Cirque, or I don't know if that's the actual name of it. Um, and then there's a kind of a Cirque in here, but it's not. But, um, these are all carved out by glaciers. Um, and then the, the sharp points, uh, which I don't know if I have a picture of that. Those are arites. Um, and then ice and snow is being pushed out through the mountains this way. And that it would periodically stop right here and these are moraines this is where it, they kind of just it, that was the extent of where it pushed at one point actually the last time it pushed snow this is the, the extent it went so we have these maps um you know for the the, the geology of uh of um the um the glacial geology the glacial uh they're, they're glacial um formations and if you have had, a, you know, it's important when you have had an entire area inundated by glaciers to maybe make a map that shows what, what, what happened because of that. It's, it kind of makes the geologic story a little bit more complete. Ah, there we go. So I, knew, I, I figured that. So when I'm pointing at some of these things, uh, like these bowls right here, these bowls, those are these. One, one, two, and three. And this is Baxter Peak. This is Pomola. Hamlin's over here, and that's what I was trying to show you. Baxter Peak is here, uh, Pomola here, and Hamlin here. And those terrains, uh, those those moraines, I said that are right. Here, those are right here, and you can clearly see them right here. This is the snow being pushed out, and it stopped on its on its last retreat right here, and made these um, these. Let's imagine a uh, a snowplow coming down and and stops. And then backs away and just leaves its snow pile. That's what that is. Um, in Katahdin, beautiful mountain. Um, it's really a, just a gigantic granitic blob um, that's about uh, halfway exposed um, from the Devonian period. 
and it's just so resistant it sticks up higher than pretty much everything else because it was a huge volcanic edifice at one point and this is part of the chamber um, and the reason why these peaks are around is because the the peaks were cooked so when this was erupting it basically warmed everything around it and it cooked it which made it also more resistant so you can kind of see the chamber tilting this way and on this side you can kind of see it tilting this way and we don't think that the the, the peak of the chamber, the height, was much more higher than it is right here because you have granophere uh, sort of in the very highest peaks, and that's sort of something you get near the edges of the, of the, uh, of the chamber. So may not have been much higher, but it goes down about another mile or so, and it's sort of shaped like a, a weird egg. Sea level change over the last uh, 16,000 years. All right, so this one always confuses me. Actually, it doesn't. Um, until I look at it for more than 30 seconds. But the way you, you kind of have to go back. So, so the way I do it is this is me standing at the beach today. And if I go back in time, I'm going to watch sea level move away from me and drop. And it's going to drop. And then it's going to really drop. And then it's going to go out all the way to the edge of the Gulf of Maine, some 300 miles out. And then it's going to rapidly come back. And rise so if we come back and if we come forward in time we're going to see the glacials retreat or the, as the glaciers grow sea level drops fast because you need water to make the glaciers and then the glaciers begin to melt but the seafloor is depressed so much that it kind of evens out and we stay submerged and then slowly water begins to speed back up and it begins to rise to where we are now and this is the inundation of the water um, at this particular time. So that just gives you an idea of how high it was. It went all the way back, almost to Mount Katahdin, almost to Farmington, Maine. That's how far what sea level was when... when uh, uh, prior to um, the maximum glacial extent. I find that fascinating. You can find these marine muds and clays and everything and silts and sands all over the, the state of Maine. It's like the majority of the quarries, you know, where I'm from down here are all around my house because there's just so much sands from glaciers depositing sands on the waterfront and then sorting them out beautifully, um, you know, to make these epic sand quarries. Um, and there's a reason why Maine has mussels and clams and rivers and lakes that are like, you know, a hundred miles inland because that was, that was salt water. And it, and as the salt water began to retreat, um, the clams, the, the salmon, the bass, mussels, they all had time to, uh, they all had time to um, adapt, and so now we have a freshwater species of those. So that explains our clams and mollusks and uh, snails and stuff in the in our lakes that are like you know an hour inland. So, anyways, that's what happened when you uh, when you had glaciers. Once that sea melted, and once that once that glacier once that ice melted back, man, you had. Uh, sea level super high but it came back and as it came back uh, it initially flooded this deep because Maine was pushed so far down but then once but then once Maine began to rebound uh, after the ice left uh, it, it slowly began to rebound and then the water began to to recede <laughs> 